First comes love. Friendship. She fell head over heels in love with him. <laughs> then comes marriage. They were the superstar couple. Then comes cheating. I made you a nurse! I think sex was at the center of a lot of this. There had been a drug issue with Donna. Donna Munda was looking for someone to kill her husband. He's a good man. It was about to meet a bad end. <clears throat> My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. It's a hit, man. Life and death are just part of the business. It's nothing personal. May 2005. It's Friday the 13th. But if everything goes according to plan, Donna Munda thinks it's going to be the luckiest day of her life. She was always positive, upbeat, bubbly and bouncy, no matter what. But not right now. Donna's marriage is on the rocks. And today, with the help of her young lover, she's going to end it with a bang. Gulam Munda is Donna's older, much older husband. A great guy. People admired him very much for his generosity, for his friendliness, for his openness. Friday the 13th will be Gulam Munda's worst day on Earth. He'll be dead before sunset. He was kind and generous. He loved and supported his wife. I mean, he stood by her through some real hard times. A perfect husband, the perfect couple. So what happened? How does a loving wife become the monster who has her husband murdered right before her eyes? Gulam Munda, a brilliant doctor, is an immigrant success story. Gulam loves America and its riches. He liked expensive cars and, and uh, expensive jewelry, watches, custom-made suits. He thought, you make enough money, you should spend it too and enjoy it. And the good doctor has an eye for pretty women. He liked somebody, he, he, he was flirted with them and, you know, tried to get them out on a date like, like normal people do. At 43, Gulam Munda meets the woman. Donna Smouse is straight-laced and young. Just three years out of high school. Kim Jordan and Debbie Engelbau are her best friends. We all basically came from middle class families, Christian families, um, went to church on Sunday, obeyed our parents, um, never really got in any trouble in school. Donna comes from a very close knit family. Many people around here, you go to college, you go somewhere else and work. She came back here, wanted to be in this community. The older doctor and the pretty young ex cheerleader hit it off. But he is twice her age. When she first started dating Gulam, I remember conversations with her on the phone, and she was very hesitant because she was uh, concerned about the age difference. But Dr. Munda knew how to take care of people. For the next 12 years, he put his young in Namorada through nursing school, and then he funded a master's degree. Donna became a nurse anesthetist, top of the line. All the while, Gulam and Donna got closer and closer. I know she fell head over heels in love with him. 
even though she was reluctant initially to get together with him. Gulam's friends think Donna is great. Her wit and beauty sure sparkle up the dinners with his Indian doctor pals, Sach Teva and Chata. They did seem to fit well together as a couple, and meeting or parties, you know, make sure to say hello to everybody and comment on people's outfits and how, how nice they are, and so people used to like that. She was fairly outgoing. She was a very likable woman. I kept telling him, why don't you get married? You should get married. It is time. You're getting old. And you should uh, settle down. Then finally, he agreed. By that time, they knew each other for a long time. And uh, his wedding was held in my house. When they married, Donna is 30, Gulam, 54. She moves into his dream house. Life is good. Everyone cheers. We're a small community, so say anybody is a superstar couple, but they were as close as you would get. Like a lot of people who make it to the top, Gulam Munda started at the bottom. He was born poor in India. He used to say that uh, there were times when there was not even enough food, you know, in the house, and he used to, like, get by with one meal a day so that his sister could eat. But Gulam managed to become a doctor. And when he was 34, he came to America for advanced training in urology, a very demanding medical discipline. He settles in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, a peaceful, family-oriented small town. Years ago, immigrants flooded into this area to work the steel mills. Today, the mills are gone. The growth industry now is medicine, perfect for a new kind of immigrant. When he moved in here, you know, I don't believe there are any other urologists in town, which is maybe the reason that he came. So he worked up very quickly a very large patient base. So he knew lots and lots of people in, in this community. As a doctor, Gulam is a true humanitarian. Thank you very much. Things are going good so far? Awesome. Uh, honestly, you cannot describe the way he was to his patients. I think he always treated them like his own family, kind-hearted, and by all, in simple terms, very sincere. That's your uh, urinal tract, right? Sometimes you get some little polyp. Gulam knows his patients' lives, even in a rich country, can be hard. In Hermitage, Gulam Munda is welcomed, honored, and loved. He supported his patients. You know, he wanted them to, to take a certain medication, and they just decided they couldn't afford it. It was common that he would order it, and he would pay for it himself to make sure that everybody was taken care of. Until the last chapter, Gulam Munda's life story would have made a wonderful lesson about hard work and sacrifice paying off. Life in Hermitage was a dream come true. Donna and Gulam Munda are pillars of the community. Beautiful as she is, Donna's no pampered trophy. She has a full-time medical career of her own. As a nurse anesthetist, Donna works hard. But it is a tough, draining, stressful life. You're just looking for the pain, OK? Then, tragically, she loses her dad, her main emotional support. It's a shattering blow. When he died, she was inconsolable. It still makes me emotional, because I know that her entire life changed from that point on. She went into such a severe depression that she pulled back from all of us. The person Donna's friends know so well is about to become a stranger. Almost like her spark died when her dad did. It seems the death of Donna's dad was what triggered her downward spiral. It would take Donna into a world of addiction and send her husband to his untimely death. What was it? that turned her from a woman who 
was a hardworking local girl. How did she make that leap to actually want to kill him? Gulam Munda thinks he's off on a wonderful family adventure. He isn't. His wife, Donna, has a terrible surprise waiting for him. She's taking her unwitting husband to his death at the hands of her hitman lover. Very strange behavior for someone who has made a career of saving lives. With her stressful job and the father she was so close to no longer there, Donna is emotionally adrift. She's in a sea of pain, and she's sinking fast. She needs somebody to rescue her, but the man who had nurtured her for all these years seems remote, oblivious, absent. She was in a severe state of depression, and she started to fall into needing to hear the positive things, needing herself to be built up again. In the household of Hermitage, Pennsylvania star couple, the bloom is off the rose. Donna has hit 40. Gulam's in his 60s. She needs energy and excitement to get her out of her rut, but he just doesn't seem up for it. Her relationship with uh, Gulam had turned a little bit cold. Their uh, intimate life, uh, was not what it had been because of some physical problems Gulam had. For a time, Donna's work is all consuming. She can forget her emotional problems at least for a while. Then everything going on in her life overwhelms her. Claire! Stay with us, honey. You can do it. Claire! Donna's job is to ease her patient's physical pain. But Donna's hurting, too. In her case, it's mostly heartache. The drugs that ease physical pain can treat that, too. On top of all the obvious hazards nurses face, there's one that's kind of a secret. It's, uh, how do I put this? You're working with a lot of people who are suffering. They lean on you. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. They need you to forget yourself and focus on their pain. Because a few drops of what you got in your pocket will make the pain go away. And when you're in the middle of it, tired, your back and your heart hurting, these little vials tempt you. You say, OK, fair is fair. I'll share your pain if you share your painkiller. Fair is fair. Nobody knows how many doctors and nurses use drugs meant for patients. But there are many. And Donna Munda was one of them. Donna was into fentanyl. It's a favorite amongst professionals. Wickedly powerful, but it doesn't show up on a drug test. Fentanyl's more addictive than morphine and 100 times more potent. A few drops are all you need. For the pain, okay? A little misdirection, and you're good to go. Nobody can tell if the patient gets every drop. It'll all be better soon, dear. Or if you save a few for a rainy day. And Donna's been facing stormy weather for a while now. I think things just spiraled out of control for her. She did make some bad choices when it came to the, the pain medication. At home, Gulam is the eternal optimist. The marriage is not going well, but he tries to keep it on track. Welcome home, darling. How you doing? How was your day at work? Trouble is, he and Donna aren't on the same page anymore. I think there's still this tendency to look at Donna as the young girl, 
even though they've been married for 20 years. You know, you still have that age difference. Uh, the older man being somewhat paternalistic in a way. Not even her best friends know what's really going on. She kind of went into isolation. She pulled back. She didn't answer phones. And I think one thing led into another at a very low point in her life. Um, I, I guess partly, too, I'm emotional because I wish I had known more of what was going on so I could have been more of a support to her. She essentially lived a double life. Her family members knew of her as a loving sister and daughter, but she had this other side. She had this drug problem. Yeah, this one. Well, Donna has pulled back from her old pals. She and Gulam keep seeing his. With them, she plays the perfect wife. Uh, Perfectly. She seemed very happy and I used to have a good, uh, you know, good time and didn't have any a specific uh, problem that she felt uncomfortable or I, we felt uncomfortable. He never said anything bad which could uh, make me think that there is a problem. But of course, there's a huge problem. And it's about to get a whole lot worse. Just because fentanyl is easy to steal doesn't mean nobody's keeping track. Donna gets caught. It's a first offense, so Donna just gets probation and rehab. And she gets fired. But that's on the QT. Her drug charges weren't really well publicized because she never pleaded or guilty or went to trial or anything like that. Gulam and Donna do an amazing job of keeping her trouble secret. She uh, kept things very much to herself. Her husband kept things very much to himself. I mean, he was a private person. I guess that's what he uh, figured out, that it's a private matter between me and my wife. Always being a very private person, I think on one hand, she would not be comfortable with calling us and saying, hey, I have this problem. You know, I need help or I'm seeking help. At 42, after studying and working her whole adult life, Donna is an unemployed drug addict with no access to the narcotic her body is screaming for. She was just emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually crushed. And I don't think she knew quite what to do or where to turn. She can't turn to Gulam. He's angry and doesn't understand. Don is now being forced to take a different path. It's rehab or back to court. If you have to go into rehab, you've probably screwed up your life. That's what they call a given. You've messed up at work, your family and friends are fed up. Part of the recovery deal is taking responsibility. Detoxing is hell, but it's nothing compared to the emotional stuff. So instead of changing themselves, a lot of people just look for a new escape. Donna finds one, a new friend. His name is Damian Bradford. Together, there'll be extremely bad news for Dr. Golan Munda. Donna Munda has been through the worst her world can dish out, and she's come out smiling. She feels like she's got a new reason to live, but that reason is the joy she feels in the arms of a young drug dealer. Damian Bradford. Donna's new boy toy. It's in Damien's bed that Donna hatches a plot to rid her life of the one thing keeping her from total happiness, her husband. She's figured the best way to move on with her life is to end his. And to think, it all began in rehab. When she went to rehab, she was done up. 
to the hilt. I mean, makeup, uh, jewelry, clothes, the whole nine yards. She wasn't dressed uh, like your stereotypical, and I'm not saying anything derogatory about rehab, but uh, people have a stereotype. Donna draws the attention of a fellow rehabber. What's up, everyone? My name is Damian Bradford, and uh, I've been a bad boy. You know, hopefully I can um, take something away from here when I leave. Damian Bradford is 23, cocaine dealer, cocaine user, a bad boy with a gun. He likes steroids and had a good way with the ladies. He had some brushes with the law, drugs, of course, assault, weapons, and he was on parole. Damian was hardcore for small town Pennsylvania, which meant he could still be fairly pleasant. He was very well groomed, muscular, very polite, very respectful. He was a smooth talker. He was a very nice guy. He sure looks fine to Donna. She hasn't had this kind of male attention in a while. Damien being uh, an attractive, uh, muscular male caught her attention. And I think her appearance caught his attention. I'm sure Damien wasn't thinking, hey, uh, this could be some type of long-term thing. I'm, I'm sure Damien was thinking, hey, she's attractive, she dresses well, hmm, maybe something could happen short-term here. OK, exchanging glances is one thing, but acting on them is another. Anybody who knows anybody who's been in rehab know that rehab romances, while frowned upon, uh, they flourish. <laughs> if you're a recovering addict, you're vulnerable. Being off drugs leaves a big, empty hole. You got to fill it with something. Your addiction says, all right, I can't have drugs. Give me something I could work with, something pleasurable. When they got physically involved, it was secret. And you had that type of uh, chemistry, that type of um, excitement. I mean, it was a cheating relationship with all the excitement and everything to go with it. Donna tells Gulam rehab is really working for her. She feels like a new woman. Maybe the sense of danger adds to the thrill. When Donna and Damien hooked up, he was sharing an apartment with a roommate. So to make sure she could see him whenever she needed a Damien fix, Donna found him his own place. And she paid the rent. His part of the bargain, I think you got the picture by now. She took care of Damien. She would give him clothes, money. He was, for all intents and purposes, what they call a kept man. You have a uh, woman that's paying all the bills, a woman that seems to have a healthy appetite. Who in their right mind would walk away from that? I mean, really. Uh, it sounds to me like a middle-aged person who meets uh, a young person, a new beginning. Donna was hooked again. Another full-blown, all-consuming addiction. If she wasn't with Damien, she was on the phone or texting him. A woman obsessed. Uh, they talked to each other at least 40 times a day, either by phone or text messaging. He called her baby girl, and, and she called him daddy. Seems kind of far-fetched for a middle-aged woman to be speaking like that, but that's what happened. Together, Donna and Damien called themselves the Double Ds. She was at a very low point in her life, and this person probably gave her attention to make her feel 
that she was important. And I think she kind of just slid right into that because I'm sure he made her feel special. Her and Damien seemed totally obsessed with each other. As she falls hard for Damien, living with Gulan becomes impossible. Their relationship was starting to crack. She's starting to call her relationship with Gulam an intolerable situation. She refers to Gulam as the prison guard watching her. Gulam has all the money. Gulam has the power. I made you a nurse! What? She tells Damien that Gulam is cruel. She indicated that uh, he was abusive to Donna Munda. He was controlling, uh, that um, uh, both physically and mentally abusive. Basically, a portrait you would paint to someone for the purpose of making that someone dislike uh, your spouse. Damien started getting feelings for her, real, genuine feelings for her. But Damien's having relationship issues of his own. Remember how pre-Donna, Damien was sharing an apartment. Her name is Charlene. She isn't happy about the double Ds, so she drops a bomb. Hi, may I speak with Dr. Munda, please? Turns out Damien's ex-roommate considers herself his fiance. Charlene McFraser, who was Damien's girlfriend, called Dr. Munda and told him about the affair. But I have some very interesting information about your wife. Because she doesn't want to lose Damien to this wealthy, older woman. Yeah, it's been happening for months now. The cat was out of the bag, and it came out scratching. Donna's marriage hit the rocks hard. And it turned out that old Ghulam, generous as he was, was also prudent. He took some precautions against a change in the marriage or weather. Way back when, he got Donna to sign a prenup. If they split, she get a quarter million, no more. But now Gulan was worth about 25 times that much. Six million and change, to be exact. Gulan's hurt, but he's not vengeful. If Donna wants out, he'll let her go. He even offers her way more than the prenup, just to make it quick and easy. Dr. Munda apparently uh, offered Donna a million dollars to walk out of the marriage. Donna refuses. She wants out all right, but she wants a golden parachute too. Dr. Munda's medical practice had made him one of the richest guys in Hermitage, PA. But Donna had discovered the money was nearly all his. That prenup was the problem, but it only kicked in if the Mundas divorced. There was a way, Donna figured, to get her fair share, to get out of her marriage, to make her lover happy and totally attached. And Gulam was old, I mean, nearly 70. Donna figured he didn't have long to live anyway. Why not just speed things up a bit? Damien thinks of himself as a bad boy, but what's going down now is way worse than bad. Donna told Damien that she wanted him to kill Dr. Munda. She promised him half of what she would get out of the doctor's multi-million dollar estate. Damien Bradford had a female throwing money at him, giving Damien a lifestyle he had never experienced before. And she convinced him that she would be receiving millions after the inheritance came in. He's in that lovey, I want to please you stage. It's a bad combination. Damien agrees, Ghulam's got to go. Donna's plan sounds simple. The idea is to make killing him look like a random drive-by. 
she had told Damian Bradford that uh, her husband goes to a mosque on a regular basis, and he went there under her direction. Donna gave him a map, gave him the route. He had his 9 millimeter handgun. Damien followed the doctor to the mosque and uh, sat outside the mosque in his car. Damien was talking to Donna by cell phone uh, during this whole thing, uh, waiting for a chance to shoot him. And he was going to basically kill him on the street. Damien Bradford is sitting outside Gulam Munda's mosque, waiting for a chance to shoot him. He spends the time talking to Coach Donna, who offers encouragement and friendly advice. But Damien doesn't get a chance to pull the trigger. But apparently, there was no clear shot available. Uh, there was just never seemed to be the right opportunity. The situation just never felt right. So Damien follows Gulam back to his office. He never tried to assassinate the doctor at that point. Damien believed it was uh, not a good place or time. So the mosque plan is a bust, but Damien has another idea. He went back to the house to see Donna Munda. Damien said, why don't we just do it right here when the doctor comes home that very night? And uh, Donna said, no, but we're going to Toledo pretty soon. We'll set something up then. Donna and her mother and Dr. Mundo were planning on a car trip to Toledo, Ohio, to look at a house that Dr. Mundo's nephew was interested in buying. Donna had established this is the opportunity when Damien could kill Dr. Mundo. All the time Donna Munda was plotting her husband's murder, she played the role of the happy wife at home and in public. And even though Gulam knew about his wife's affair with Damien, he never let the facade of happy contentment drop, not even to their closest friends. Now we went to dinner, some crab house. There was not any hint of any discord or fights or anything like that. They seem fairly happy. Maybe Donna seems fine because she thinks all her troubles will soon be over. Talking about that every night? Every tick of the clock brings closer the moment when she and Damien will be together, rich and free. They go over their scheme one last time. They met earlier in the day. She gave him directions to Toledo where they were going. Then they separated. Donna and Damien now have a plan they're convinced will work, an ambush disguised to look like a robbery. It's all set up. The plan's got some flaws, which is why we know about it. But baby girl and daddy, they think they got a winner. The night before the trip, Donna and Damien text furiously back and forth, like always. She tells him she'll fall asleep counting little Damien's. Aw, isn't that sweet? May 2005. It's Friday the 13th. Damien is dressed all in black, dressed in a hoodie over his head, has a baseball cap on, a black shirt, 
pants, the whole nine yards. Damien sits in wait at a general store uh, near the Munda house. She sent some uh, text messages that seem innocuous enough, uh, but were signals that they were leaving. Damien watches the three of them leave and starts following them. The Moonders are on their way to Ohio. Donna has invited her mother, Dorothy, along for the trip. Nice touch. What kind of monster would have her husband murdered in front of her elderly mother, right? Besides, Donna knew her mom was fond of the guy who put her girl through school. This would be the last chance to spend some quality time together. Donna and Damien haven't planned out a location for the hit. At some point, the Moondas Jag will just pull off the road. And Damien will have to wing it. At first, Gulam's at the wheel. About an hour in, he makes a stop. A crowded service plaza is no place for a hit. But the stop does give Donna a chance to take over driving. When they came out, uh, she wanted to drive and convinced Dr. Munda to let her drive the vehicle. When they get out of the rest area, Damien follows them. And they drive for about 20 minutes. And uh, it was very sad and tragic for Ghulam. And to me, senseless, very senseless. I mean, they could have worked something out. She could have walked away with money. A million bucks is a lot of money. No matter what her intentions, Donna was certainly not a hardened criminal uh, by any stretch. Donna Mundo pretended she had some stomach virus or she was nauseous. She pulled off. Damien sped up, got right behind the vehicle within a couple car lengths. The plan was when she pulled off, that meant for Damien to pull off and to execute the plan. What Donna and Damien have plotted for months is finally going down. Dr. Munda was on his way out of the vehicle. Uh-uh, uh-uh, get back, get back in the car. Damien at gunpoint ordered him back in the vehicle, demanded Dr. Munda's wallet. Ulam was very scared. There was fear in his face. He did not resist in any way, shape, or form. I just followed uh, orders, uh, gave him his wallet with about $3,000 uh, in it in cash. Gulam Munda always carries a big wad of cash. He's told his pals it's his survival plan. Anyone who mugs him will go away happy. The mugger will be happy, but Gulam will be dead. Mrs. Uh, Smiles is in the back seat behind the doctor. Uh, Don is in the uh, driver's seat. Damien basically just puts the gun to the side of his head and fires. Oh, God. Donna's a nurse. She acts the part of the emergency specialist. Donna's doing CPR on the doctor. Dr. Munda's dead. 
for all intents and purposes, probably as soon as the bullet hit him. The bullet hits him right up here. Um, didn't have a chance. Damien Bradford is long gone. He tosses the gun and hightails it back to Pennsylvania. She was setting up her husband uh, for nothing but money, uh, having her own mother witness the crime. Uh, it was just horrible, horrible. When the cops get there, Donna tells them what she saw. It's a pile of bull designed to mislead them. The guy, she says, was sure. He had a mean voice, and he was driving a minivan. And I, I don't know. I reached into my purse, and I gave him Donna tells the state police that she can't see the gunman's face because uh, he has a uh, ski mask kind of thing over his face. Donna's story was she couldn't even tell what race the killer was. Thing is, Donna's mother, Dorothy, could. She told the cops the shooter was an African-American. It's not the only place Dorothy and Donna's story diverge. Something that sure to set an investigator's antenna quivering. We pulled, we pulled us over, and we pulled over because Gulam wanted to drive. And, and then this man... Dorothy tells police Donna decided to pull off the road. Donna says it was her husband's idea. Sure, it's a detail. That's where the devil is, right? In the details. I got out of the car, and I ran around, and I started to give him CPR. That was just one of the things that didn't add up. The biggest was that people just don't get robbed and murdered on the sides of turnpikes. Not since the State 80 was a stagecoach route anyway. Maybe the double Ds had been watching the wrong kind of shoot 'em ups. There were other weird things. Why did the highwaymen just shoot one of them? It just wasn't adding up. A few days later, Donna makes a public plea for help. Please, if anybody knows anything, please help us. That's all I'm asking. My husband was such a good man. He was a kind, loving person. He was a wonderful husband. He did not deserve this. Actually, the cops are pretty sure Donna is involved. But they need more than a bad feeling to hang a murder rap on a grieving widow. The break comes a week later. The cops get an anonymous call from someone who's sure down is dirty. Yep, Charlene's back. Hi, I have some information. Charlene calls the state police, tells them uh, about Donna. I'd rather not give that out. She doesn't tell her police who she is, but you know they figure that out pretty quick. I have information about a murder that happened on the highway tells him where Damien lives, the whole nine yards. Charlene got the ball rolling. Actually, Charlene wants to sink Donna. But investigators link Donna to Damien, and he's the one who gets snagged. The cops hit Damien's apartment. It's big news. Investigators obtain the search warrant because they say Bradford is a person of interest in the shooting death of Dr. Gulam Munda. The evidence in his apartment bloody clothes, cell phone bills, and Gulam's money is more than enough to bring him in. Damien knows that Donna's got his back, just like she promised. He was counting on her to testify that it wasn't him. She was his star witness. They had the text messages. They weren't going to deny the affair. The, the affair was what it was. While Damien sits in jail, the cops keep building their case. In a bit of a technical coup, they actually map out exactly where Donna and Damien's cell phones were in the hours leading up to the hit. Damien's only chance is that his baby girl will rescue her daddy. So uh, Damien had to hope that Donna was going to stick to the plan and testify on his behalf and say it wasn't him. 
but she chose not to testify. Damien took that as a message of every man for himself. So Damien cut a deal. He admitted to killing Gulam Munda, and he agreed to testify against Donna. When she went to trial, Damien was the prosecution star witness. And as you can imagine, the media went ballistic. There was a lot of interest in this case from the get-go because it had everything. I mean, it had sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There was a lot of questions of, you know, what's going on here. And it was very, very far leap to go from, all right, so they're not getting along very well, to her actually wanting him dead. Uh, people are still grappling with that question. You know, I don't know that there's an answer to it. To our eyes, at least from my personal perspective, I mean, I had, if anybody asked me at that time, I would say they are crazy to even mention it or even think of it that she was any way involved in that. Till that day, we were giving her benefit of doubt. We, we were very sympathetic. And then it turned into a complete hate. The verdict? Donna Munda is guilty. Donna got life without parole. Thanks to his plea deal, Damien Bradford got 17 and a half years. If she's still interested, Charlene could have him back in 2022. Uh, Donna had it all, millionaire's wife, uh, family, friends. She lost it all. She has nothing. She has no money. She's in jail for the rest of her life. The Donna that I've always known and loved and still know and love to this day and keep in touch with, it would be unfathomable for me to think that she could have ever masterminded or planned anything that would harm Ghulam in any way. And he was a dear friend, like my brother, you know, and uh, so I really miss him deeply, you know. So it's very senseless. For what? Who, who gained anything? Nobody won. It's never made sense to anybody but Donna and Damien. There was another pet, less travel by, but people take it every day. Donna and Damien were on the road to recovery. They got turned around. They had their eyes on the wrong prize. They might recover from their addictions. Maybe they already have. But Gulam Munda never will. He never even had the chance to understand what was happening. To him, it was just a senseless crime.